Um, thank you all for coming out in the storm. That didn't end up being as bad of a storm as we thought it could be. So I appreciate you all filling this room tonight. And thank you to our board for deciding it was a go. Yes. Go. <laughs> all right. Um, so we're a national organization again as of March. For those of you that have been here, you already know this. We have 10 cities and 10 chapters. And we're um, talking to Dallas and Las Vegas about starting some chapters. So we might be at 12 by the end of the year. And for those of you that don't know, AITP is older than me. We're 75 years old, 1949, older than most of you, I think. Um, we've got a lot of history, and um, we've been around a long time, so you're part of something bigger than just us. Those other chapters do a lot of virtual meetings still. Um, they haven't fully adopted, like we have, about being back in person together. And so you have the ability to attend some of their virtual events, too. So as we get the national website up and running, I think we're targeted to go live at the end of this month. I've been on that committee. Um, <laughs> you will then be able to see their event calendars as well. Um, we also have a job board page. I know that a lot of you are here in the room because you are looking for a new opportunity, and we want to be a good connector of um, hiring managers and recruiting firms with job seekers. And so we have launched our job board. It is a part of our Wild Apricot CRM system. It is live. Um, and if you have an interest of posting a job at your company, please see me and I'll help you get it set up. It's pretty easy. Even I can figure it out, which people know that means a lot because I'm not the most technically enabled person in the room. And this is my lovely board of volunteers that have helped put out all of these programs for us your whole year, 12 months of programming. So thank you to the board members that serve that are in the room for showing up. Thank you. And I'm proud because even when we had COVID happen in March of 2020, we have not missed a month. So we have consistently delivered a program for you amongst hurricanes and pandemics. <laughs> um, every month, you will always find us on Thursday. Um, so thank you to our board. And we have a MAC, which is our CIO advisory board um, of individuals that help advise us and give us uh, you know, advice about what's happening in the market, what technology topics and trends that we should be considering. Um, they meet twice a year. Um, we will be doing musical chairs and talking about our new board seats later this year and also our max seats. So if you have interest in serving in either of these and um, haven't yet, please see me and I'll let you know which chairs open up and which table that you can join. Um, but please let me know if you're interested. Membership. So we are continuing to grow our membership. We have both the annual members and the 90-day members. So some new members in the room, thank you for joining. Um, or renewing or becoming a part of our organization. Um, if you are a guest today, it's easy for you to switch and become a member. Um, we will credit you back the guest fee that you pay today if you convert to an annual membership within the next 30 days before our next meeting. And you can normally see Brooke about that, but he's not here today, but you can email, or you can see Jerome or any of us on the board, but email him at membership. Um, this is how you can become a member. We have three different ways to be involved. Um, annual member is the 12 month membership. It's not calendar year, it's based on the month that you join for 12 months um, of programming. And you can proxy your seat to someone if you um, can't attend the meeting so that that seat doesn't go to waste. We also have the 90 days for $90 membership, which is basically buy two, get one free. If you like a sale like me, then that's for you. <laughs> if you are a job seeker, that's for you. Um, and then the guest fee is that $45 a meeting. Um, and you can share, like I said, with your membership if you can't attend. And we also have a group membership. So we have two new group members, um, Kimberly Horn. Just saw someone from Kimberly Horn here today. I'm calling you out. <laughs> Thank you. And Nick, your CIO, serves on our map. Um, and Robert Half, I don't know if they're here today. So we have two new corporate group members. I know Dexian is here. I know Blue Cross is here. You're some of our corporate members. Candle Science usually shows up. I don't see that room. room. Sorry? State employee. And State Employee Crime Union, we have employees of. So we have 
five, six. Group members now, six. Six group members now. So corporate members, that allows them to share the seats with people on their team, depending on the topic, to use it for recognition, um, professional development opportunities, etc. So really excited about that. Um, accurate headcount. So this is a friendly reminder um, to that even if you are a member, to please register. Um, or else you're going to keep getting emails from Scott that says, "Hey, we're having a meeting. Have you registered yet?" <laughs> Once you register, you don't get those email reminders. Um, but that helps us give a headcount. It also helps us potentially get into the big room that we all know that I love because it's prettier than this room, because I'm not a big fan of the wood paneling. Um, so if we have 60 people, we get in the big room, but we need to have 60 people. Um, and it's very important when we go on field trips. So in October, yes. we will have a field trip to, Rest, Red, to Red Hat. But well, we're gonna close it off in the King Club. So <laughs> when we go, oh wait, the U Club is amazing. Yeah. They accommodate us, they're really flexible, they're lovely. We, enjoy their hospitality here. Um, we will be here next month for September for John Lane's Culture of Communications event. But in October, we're going to go to Red Hat. Downtown, night for beautiful patio. Yes, and those of you that were here last year that went to Red Hat, awesome. it's amazing. It's got a really nice view of downtown. We need an accurate headcount in advance so we can get you security badges because there's a little bit more logistics when we go somewhere else that involves security, badges, parking, parking <laughs> catering. And so help us help you by registering early. And then this is directions on how to proxy your seat. Um, sponsors, we have four levels of sponsorship. Um, starting at the Social Plus sponsorship, I believe we have a sponsor for Red Hat. We will take another. We will take another. <laughs> More the barriers. And we would Make love a sponsor safe. to help us with our holiday party so that Absolutely. we could Absolutely. potentially go somewhere fun and have a cool end awesome. of year celebration. Yeah. This is the way to get involved. If your company has extra marketing dollars that they haven't spent yet this year and they want a nonprofit to support that is a fun, engaging, lively group of IT professionals that they could potentially recruit and hire to their company, yes. come see us. Yes. And thank you to our annual sponsor, Corsica. Not sure if she's in the room. I think. All right, so tonight, you came here to hear Michael, not me. There wasn't as good of a stand up comedy routine this morning, or this evening, I'm sorry, the rain. Um, so, Michael is going to talk to us about process based framework and how to tame the chaos, the chaos of the storm. Are you going to fit this hurricane in wow. the storm? <laughs> wow. Weave it in. <laughs> Weave it in, tie it in. Um, Michael is the founder and managing director of Process Inventory Advisors. He's a thought leader in digital transformation and operational excellence with 25 years of experience in financial services. It empowers his clients with innovative solutions in technology, process, and risk. He has a new book, Digital Transformation Success, introducing the groundbreaking <laughs> process inventory framework for operational efficiency and strategic alignment. Please welcome Michael Shank. That was amazing. That's like that was fast. That was super great. But your office is kind of flooded. <laughs> thank, you, thank, thank you, Kate, for having me. Thanks for all coming in. And uh, surviving the storm again. I don't have any jokes or solutions to, to that, but I'll try. Um, okay, so raise your hand. Who's been part of a transformation that know even what this topic is? Great. How many people keep your put your hand up if uh, if you survived chaos in a transformation? <laughs> Someone. We all we all have our, our war stories. So That's right. <laughs> let, let me do a little bit of definition just so we, we're grounded. So. A transformation is a profound change in how an organization operates or delivers value for their customer. And it's profound in that it cuts across people, process, technology. They're, they're typically multi-year, tens or hundreds of millions of dollars in the program. So it takes coordination across a large number of people. Um, my book is called Digital Transformation. I'll just throw this up there too. 
digital transformation is adopting new technologies, automation, AI, IoT, you name it, to change your business model uh, or how you run your business. And, and I'll add another one too, is, is in, and this is kind of my, my new definition, which is there's a lot of data in how we run our organization, and if you digitize that and tap into it, you could, you could really uh, drive a lot, of, a lot of transformations. So, um, so some stats. So 70% of red transformations fail. And this is a known stat in the industry. It's fairly ubiquitous. But I, I found this other one too. The, the spend for digital transformations is expected to exceed $3.4 trillion. To put that in context, there's only five countries in the world that have a GDP more than that. So it's a, it's a fairly large um, endeavor. So what, what does that mean? What's the implications? Obviously, lost investments, um, that, that money that just goes down the drain that's spent on the transformations and the chaos that, uh, that's spent on it. Uh, but it's also frustrated stakeholders that want to improve the environment that can. Uh, unsatisfied customers, and, and there's a, plenty of war stories out there from, uh, like the one I always use is, is Nokia. Um, so in 2006, they had 51% of the market share of phones. That same year, Apple came out with a new phone that had a superior operating system and a better touch screen interface. Fast forward to 2013, Nokia, because they couldn't keep up with the transformation in the digital age, they lost 90% market share. Um, they ended up selling to uh, Microsoft and no, no longer in the, the phone business. Uh, and then that's the lost ground competitor. So it's a, it's a pretty impactful uh, topic. So, so what is the root cause? In a, in a word or in a succinct way, it's the complexity of our organizations. They're so complex and there's so many people that have to coordinate around a digital transformation that it's, it's uh, yeah. organizations are complex, people process technology, there's so many things, there's only a very few number of people that know how things actually work. Um, transformations are long, long multi-year efforts and it takes a sustained Kind of commitment and focus and getting everyone aligned to what they're doing. Uh, com composed of diverse teams. So this is an important one that I'll, I'll touch on more. But everyone has their own language. In fact, I'll hit it now. Um, if you guys know the famous tree swing diagram. So what the, what the business, uh, or the customer explained, what the, what the business wanted, what the analyst thought, what the developer created, et cetera. And you can see how these different languages and perspectives play, them, play, play out. So everyone hears the instructions their own way through their own filter. And that in doing something as large as a transformation, we all have impacts or implications for that. Um, and then that ultimately hinders communication and collaboration. We just fail to work together over a sustained period of time. Um, so, so my hypothesis, the 30% that succeed, why do they succeed? They probably have a transformation leader with superhuman capabilities that knows, that works a lot of hours, but has the pulse on what everyone is doing and can direct it. That's not sustainable, and that's obviously uh, not something that could that could transcend other organizations. So I'll jump to the, the punchline, and I'll explain a, a little bit of this later. But ultimately, if there's one thing you take out of this, it's there is a paradigm shift needed in how we think about the topic and process. So process is, has typically been, or conventional thinking is, process is something we have to optimize or re-engineer and make process better. But I think it's so much more than that. Process is, to me, the connective tissue that joins all of these different concerns together. Um, and, and if we could tap into it, and that's what this diagram in the right shows. So if you can get a hold of your process, if you think about process, you need technology to run process. You need people to run process. You may need vendors. You may need um, uh, products and services, etc. If you could understand your process environment, now you could link and have more. Uh, you could understand your organizational knowledge in a precise way. Um, it provides a common language for joining those different uh, uh, perspectives together. So it's a it's a way to um, precisely say what I need to do and get all of those groups that are practitioners in those teams together. Um, and it connects the dots to, to provide a clear understanding. I look at it as, um, I always use this example of Google Maps. So Google Maps is, at the end of the day, a large data integration program. So you have traffic data, you have restaurant ratings, you have 
um, satellite imagery, you have on the ground imagery. All of that data needs to be resolved to something that Google calls the ground truth. The ground truth is just what is the anchor that you know is true that you have to, you have to align to. Um, so obviously in their case, the ground truth is the physical environment. Everything has to resolve to a physical address or whatnot. And if you could think about this way, if you got all this organizational knowledge, and if you could identify the ground truth, and in the organization, I believe it's process, then you could you could get all your information together. Um, I posted this on, on LinkedIn. I got this is my viral post. I got 60, 62,000 views. So clearly, I've touched a nerve out there. Um, okay, so. So my hypothesis or my, my kind of main theme here is I think process is the solution to transformation challenges. Um, it's, a, it's a big statement, but I really believe it, and obviously I wrote a book about it. So what I'll talk about here is, is the case for why process is, a, is the solution. I will talk about what the process inventory is in, in some level of detail and how you create it uh, and manage it, uh, and then how we could use this concept to deliver value for your organization. So a little bit about me, a, 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 a more thorough introduction. Uh, so I spent 25 years in, in consulting and in, in financial services. Uh, first 10 years of my career was at Accenture. I was a, a core technologist, Java C++ programmer. I was a solution architect. I led large development <coughs> efforts. All I knew of the world was, was my code clean? Did I deliver it on time? Did it deliver the functionality? I knew nothing about what the business did. And I, I joined Bank of America, it's not, it's not up here, but I joined Bank of America for two years, same technology role. Then I joined Ernst & Young, and at that point they did not have a deep technology um, practice. So one of my first clients was a, a large bank, and they said, they had money at the end of the year burn a hole in their pocket. So they said, you know, can you create a, a business capability model for us? So we interviewed some people in the business and created this business capability model that described everything the bank did on a single sheet of paper. And it went a couple <coughs> levels, levels deeper than that. But it was like an epiphany moment for me. I was like, wow, like this can be a great communication language to get everyone on the same page. So I just, I dedicated myself from that point on and I need to learn more. I created a, uh, a business architecture practice at EY and then later I learned that you need business architecture, if you guys are familiar with the concept, really stops the capability model. But you need to go deeper, you need to go to bounds of process to solve a lot of issues. So I, I created EY's first process excellence practice and really kind of dove into this topic and worked with a lot of clients and, and kind of a lot of different diverse set of challenges to understand how this topic can um, solve issues uh, that they're facing. And I kept, kept uh, refining it and, and testing it in new ways until I, until I got to a point like, wow, this is really, Powerful, and that's why I started thinking about writing a book. But going to the topic of taming chaos, I really believe that, and, and you, know, you guys raised your hands if you've seen chaos. I've had tons of horror stories where uh, the strategy is not clear to teams on the ground, they don't know what they're doing, plans aren't clear, uh, different teams don't know what their specific responsibilities are, and this seems like the antidote to that, that chaos. So, so then I, I left and so I, I started thinking about the book, but then I left and I joined Citibank and I was head of process excellence for the US retail bank. It's been about two years there, but I left in uh, March of 23. I said, I'm going to leave the corporate world and I'm going to write this book. So I spent, so from March until December is when it published. And then, and then I've been <coughs> promoting it and building my own consulting and training company on top of that. So I do have, you guys are really interested in this. I brought six copies, so I have to give, give some away if uh, you guys you know, think it'd be useful for your situation. Okay. Um, so what is the key to success? It's to get your organization into alignment. And what does that mean? So first it means vertical alignment. So having everyone from your C-suite, your C CEO, down to individual contributors, fully understanding of what their role is in the transformation in a precise way. And it's horizontal. Alignment. So that's getting the various teams from business, technology, risk, data, etc., understanding their role and understanding how other other practitioner teams work, so that there's clear collaboration across. So everyone is is working as kind of a, a fine-tuned machine. So how do you get to alignment? And, and I was reading an article the other day in, in uh, Harvard Business Review, 
about getting alignment. And, and it's the same story. There's been articles for the last 30 years on this topic. And it's always, well, define racy and define roles and responsibilities, communicate, blah, 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 blah. It doesn't fix anything. <laughs> but to me, to achieve alignment in a real, tangible way, you need a common language. Um, so that common language, so if you're going to establish a common language, what would it look like? First, it has to be business oriented because we have to, you guys have been through transformations. The first thing you need to, to think about is what value am I delivering for the business and for the customer? So you've got to look through everything through that lens. Um, it's got to represent different levels of granularity. So it's got to be useful for the c that's defining the strategy down to the lower level practitioner that's doing development, testing, operating, whatever, whatever process they're operating. It's got to be useful all across. Um, it's got to facilitate cross-functional collaboration. So that's breaking down silos, um, really being transparent about who does what uh, so, that, so that people know who to work with. Um, it's got to capture the idiosyncrasies of each of the organizational units. So um, I don't know if you guys are familiar with APQC or business capability models, but those are, those are abstract concepts that if I do something like at Citibank, for instance, I can open an account in the mortgage business, in the credit card, in the retail bank, in wealth management, et cetera, et cetera. In one of these generic models, it'll just show me one, one account. Well, that's not good enough because those operate in different systems with different people, with different risk profiles, you name it. I need to understand all of those because they all, all have a different role to play if I need to change the organization. Um, and then be comprehensive. So when I say comprehensive, I want to describe whatever scope of the, or, of the, the organization I'm doing the transformation on. I need to know everything that happens at, at a high level. And then you can dive deep, deeper down at whatever level of granularity you need, you need to drive to. So to me, the, the only candidate that satisfies that is process. There, I, I thought about this extensively. It's the only thing um, that, that I do. Uh, and you can see this picture on on the right of what that looks like. So you just take your organization, you get business unit one, and I do a taxonomy. Um, and I just list out uh, a taxonomy of processes. And I do business unit two, and business unit three. And I get my process groups and my processes. So that becomes the common language uh, to, to drive transformations. So how do you construct it? So to be, I mentioned comprehensive and complete, you need to, to, to anchor something, to anchor to something that's comprehensive which is the organizational hierarchy. So to create it, there's no easy button. You have to do an interview process. So you start at the top of the organizational hierarchy, you ask a simple question. What is it that you do? When they, when they give you your answer, you, you take that into, you, you turn it into verb, noun, kind of process, process. Um, but then you ask their teams what they do. And you ask their teams what they do. You walk down the organizational hierarchy until you get to a level where you feel you've captured all the processes. And then I go back up and, and get at a formal attestation. So I, I go to the team and say, is this an accurate represent? I want a formal email or workflow, or I need, I need to document it. Is this a complete representation of your processes? I go to their boss and that's the same thing. I go to their boss. Ultimately, everyone's saying, yes, this is accurate and complete. So, so now I can use this uh, for all my transformation purposes. Um, you need to anchor to the organization. Um, so a, a couple things about this slide, and, and I think what's new and unique about this is, and if you guys are, anyone familiar with business architecture? Business architecture. Um, and then obviously people in the process. And, and oh, by the way, people, people please jump in with questions. I should have mentioned that earlier. Um, do you want? Um, but I think one, one thing that those two communities have gotten wrong is they view themselves as separate. So business architecture is viewing the organization from a 30,000 foot view level. So decision makers, leaders can make, okay, you know, what is my top priority, my most important capability, and where do I put my funding? But it doesn't connect down the process. And the process has always been at like the ground level. How do things work and how do I fix things? But they don't really, they've never really connected. And in this new kind of view, you want one unified model that describes everything from your organization at a high level to low level that really meets the needs of whoever's doing the analysis. Uh, so that's this, this framework here. And you can see it at the top is the strategy. So who are you as a, as a company? What's your, what's your mission, uh, mission, 
Where, what's your vision? Where are you going? What are your strategies? How are you getting there? Uh, and then you could drive that down to what my organization does, uh, which is which is the process inventory and the capability model. And I could explain, I'll explain the differences in the subsequent slide. But now once I have the what, a full collection of all my process names, my process inventory, then I could drive down and I could describe the how. How do each of those processes work via your, your standard process models? And then I could attach um, data within the, the uh, process metadata. And I'll, and I'll get more into that as well. But then I could go up process inventory, as I mentioned, is, is defined through organizational hierarchies, which means each of the taxonomies, each part of the taxonomy is within an organization. But then you have end to end these customer journeys and these value streams that cut across. And do they cut across organizational hierarchies? And if you define those now, and customer journey is really an outside in view from what the customer sees. Um, so if I, if I document that, now I know the end to end and I know what specific uh, processes happen and I know the resources that, that happen within those. Um, and then the metal model. So um, you know, business architects in here know BizBoc and TOGAF and there's metal models. Same thing is, is required here. You need to understand how the, all these concepts connect together to give you that one view that different people can use for their level of analysis. So this so then process inventory is a modeling concept, but it's also data integration. So I mentioned the, the Google Maps and the, uh, the the ground truth. All of our organizations have operational data that's locked in various data stores that right now are unconnected from each other. So every, every organization has an application repository that describes what their applications are. They may have a risk repository or GRC that defines their risk and controls. They'll have a, a data repository or a data model, you know, product catalogs, et cetera, et cetera. How do you tap into that? And when you're trying to do something as, as complex as a transformation, you've got to pull all of this data together to understand how things work so that you can make decisions of what the future looks like. Well, in this view, you take that data and you, you bring it into a process, uh, uh, business process analysis tool. And there's a lot of tools in the market that do this. There's software AG Harris, there's my graphics or Signavio, there's um, uh, uh, GB Tech Fit, there's a whole bunch of them. But you take that data and you, you pull it into a library. And then as you're bringing in the, in the middle there, you see the process inventory, you're building your taxonomy of processes, you're building your process models. But you take that information, you align it to the appropriate process and the process model. What you're creating is a comprehensive repository of all organizational knowledge that can be sliced and diced depending on what you're trying to accomplish. It really becomes super powerful um, when you're driving a transformation. And here's an example. So I take my, my system data out of the system repository. I don't need all the data, so maybe I just need the key identifying ones, the system ID and system name. I pull that into a system library. And then when I'm creating a process model, you can see this activity Activity box, and then I just tag the, the system on it. So now I know kind of if I do that across the entire organization, now I know all the places where that system lives. And if I need to change that system or, or even retire that system, now I know all the impacts, all the users, uh, everything, so that when I drive a project, I could be complete. Um, so there's there's a couple topics on the slide. First is the uh, dictionary versus the thesaurus. So, um, so in the in the um, and this goes back to, to business architecture and capability models. But I need both an organization aware view and an organizationally agnostic view. So because there's different different analysis needs here. So in this case, I have three organizations that do kind of an account opening thing, and I use the the language of each of the organizations. But one is account opening. Another one's onboard client, another one's um, set of customer. These are all, so I need to know the specifics there, but I also want to know the thesaurus, because if I want to standardize processes across different groups, or I want to use the same technology, or, or same, same risk and controls, or whatever that is, I need to know exactly where those locations are, who the process owners, uh, et cetera. And that's where the two models integrated together become very powerful. And that standard model can be an APQC, it can be a, um, a business architecture, business capability model, et cetera. 
<laughs> but then there's there's another concept here too, which is accountability. And, and I think that's the key to innovation. I, I wrote an article about this, but in the new digital age, uh, there's there's a, a movement towards this thing called democratized innovation, which means that everyone in the organization has some level of, of expertise in what they do. In traditional models, um, innovation comes from the top of the house or a centralized group like an R&D group. But in the new democratized innovation, everybody has power to drive change and make their, their slice of the world better. So how do you do that? There's a lot of things that are, need to be in place. One is um, accountability, and then um, the other one is um, autonomy. So if you give people, when you change the culture, where people understand what they that they, um, um, they are allowed to drive change, that they're allowed to experiment, that they're allowed to test different ideas, and understanding that failure will, ha will happen, but over time, uh, progress will, will, will occur. And then you also drive accountability, so making people clear what exactly they own. So if you drive this and you document all your processes, now I know who my process owners are from a day-to-day -day and who can improve the environment, and then also my global process owners of who's driving consistency across those different processes. But if I know my process and I attach all my, my metadata, now I know exact uh, ownership across my applications, my risks, my vendors, all of that metadata. So it really makes uh, accountability. Yeah. So I'll try to speak up. I'll use my English board to Yes. Um, to our question, you talked about culture. Yeah. So that initial interview process that, that's probably a very time and energy effort capture. Once you've done it like anything else, it's only as good as like snapshot of time. Six months later, like first question is like how do you maintain it? Great Second, question. how often, especially if let's say there's a big merger or acquisition and you have to introduce new people who maybe come with a different culture. Yep. Right? And you're trying to get everyone to own board and Let's, let's have the same goals in mind, right? So how do you integrate those folks? So maintaining and then integrating when you have major change. Yes. Great questions. Okay. L love that question. I get that question all the time. So there's two, two answers to the first part, which is how do you maintain it? Um, and I'll talk about you need to build a process capability or a process center of excellence. So people that build this information and then there's stewards for owning and maintaining. The um, uh, the first the, their, that team that organization needs to be responsible for governance, and I do a periodic attestation has to be part of it. So every six months, a year, whatever is appropriate for your organization, they need to go back out to the business and say, what is it? You know, is and put it in front of them. Is this still accurate? The changes have been made. But let's let's work through this and make it you know, make the adjustments to make it complete and get the attestation. Again. The second and probably most powerful one is if you make this an anchor for how an organization works, how you do risk management, how you do projects, how you do um, a strategy definition, that, now you have a bunch of stakeholders throughout the organization that rely on this, and it puts a lot of pressure, now let's make sure this is complete. And I work with a lot of banks, so risk assessments are, are very important. So before you do a risk assessment, let's look at our, our process inventory and make sure that's accurate and complete, because I'm gonna look at each of those processes to what risks happen, to what controls need to be, to be there. So that's that's the first part of your question. The second part is the um, the, the culture and getting people aligned in, in, a, in a, a merger. Is I was and I've I've worked in a lot of mergers where you have two groups that that do essentially the same thing. And now you got to create one company. I think the best step is to look at the taxonomy and say, okay, I have a current state set of processes over here. I have a current state of processes over there. Let's look at what the new taxonomy looks like. Let's look at where people, process, and technology will play in the future. And then once I have that, those people there and I have definitions of those processes, now I can align their job aids, their training, their procedures, everything to what they need to, to do to operate in the new world. I'll do that answer. Doesn't that, <clears throat> quick question though, but if you are going through a merger, you know, AKA like a truce or something like that, yeah. You are inherently already now going through a a massive transformation because you've got two different technology groups, and you're actually then you almost have a, another transformation, and you now have other micro transformations under that, 
so it, it almost becomes, I think, even bigger, right? Because, because now you actually have different stakeholders and integrating that actually becomes even that much more paramount to your business and success. But you're gonna have somebody who's deciding. Like somebody bought some of them. There has to be someone saying, the future is gonna be, yes. and we need to work together towards it. When you have too many cooks in the kitchen and too many people arguing, that's where you can get, like yes. you're not working together, right? Yeah, so somebody needs to though define who's in charge, and what roles, and who's making decisions right to that point. Usually whoever has the most people on the board. <laughs> or whoever bought who. Whoever has the most money. <laughs> whoever lives the wrong. Hypothetical. Yeah, yes, yeah. That helps too. So, so moving on, I just want to take this out of the theoretical and make it real. So. Um, I mentioned I have a consulting company and I'm doing consulting and training. I did a process inventory for my own organization. And you can see, you know, this isn't based on any kind of industry standard framework. It's literally just what is it that I do? And I created buckets and then listed all the, the processes. So I do consulting, which I need to engage with prospects and create proposals and identify resources for these projects and deliver the consulting services. And I'm going to roll out training uh, based on Kendra's help. So I need to. And I'm conducting webinars and I have to deliver, design the training, deliver it, et cetera, et cetera. You can see, you know, hopefully when you look at this, it's very easy to read. It's very easy to tell what I do. Now, could you imagine this if you had this? Could you imagine if you had this throughout your organization? If there's a team that's, you know, you kind of don't really know what they do, if you could look up and say, ah, I know exactly what they do. And I, I put people's names next to it who owns this. So now I I know, I know what they do, I know who the owners are, I know, I know who to talk to. And that's, I just wanted to show this just to take it out of the, the conceptual and into the real. Does this make sense? Can you read this and see what my organization does? Uh, so Jerome, this kind of gets into uh, a little bit of what you, what you touched on. So if you're going to do this, you need a process capability or a process center of excellence. So if, if you're gonna create one, and I, I work with a lot of the tool companies as well. And I see a lot of customers that buy process tools to document, but they don't know how to make it real and deliver enterprise value for their organization. So the key to this is you gotta think through all these different aspects. So what is my strategy? Why am I doing this? What's my value proposition? Um, how do I, how do I uh, intend to use this concept to deliver value for my organization? Um, what are my frameworks and standards? So there's a lot of different model types. You mentioned value streams and customer journeys and processes. And, you know, what are you using? And what are your standards? Um, and what metadata am I going to include? So there's a lot of decisions that have to be made. The value case definitions, and I'll, I'll talk through this, but okay, so I document my processes. So what? What am I going to do with it? I, at some point, I got to I got to leverage it to add value. So let's define this. Um, the operating model, and this is with, within the center of excellence, so how do you do things like governance and maintain the, the tool and standards and, and uh, <coughs> document processes, Inter internal to the CA, uh, COE and external. So what's the role of a process owner, a value stream owner, et cetera. The tooling, change management definition, and then delivery planning. It's really, it, you, you've got to think through this holistically, and this is a lot of what I do in my consulting work is help companies uh, define this for their own context. Um, okay, so now I'll, I'll go into Okay, so now I document my process inventory and I document my processes. How do I deliver value through the organization? I just put a sample of kind of some of the metrics that you can expect, depending on what you're trying to do. And that's what you gotta define. But you can obviously deliver your transformation, which means on time, on budget, it delivers to the expectations that you laid out. Um, it could help with innovation. Um, so getting better at all levels throughout the organization. Uh, employee engagement through better accountability and knowing how they get their, their work done. Um, I won't go through all these, but and it's probably even a subset of what, what can be. Um, all right, so this this I think is a the pretty important figure. Um, so okay, so I've documented my process inventory. I know everything that happens. What am I going to do with it? So starting uh, right here, strategy to impact. Um, there's there's a lot of companies. This C-suite will come out with vague strategy statements. Like I, I have a colleague that's like, oh, my CEO is like, we're going to be SaaS first. He's like, I don't know what that means. <laughs> well, you, well, that means something to the marketing team. It means something to the sales team. It means something to the engineering team. It 
mean something to the support team. Let's map it out. Let's let's take that vague strategy statement and map it to our process inventory so we can be very precise on what has to change. Your transformation. So you could use this to define your transformation strategy, define your roadmap, and manage your journey. The change process. So everything from uh, I have an idea I need to change to scoping it, defining requirements, and everything that has to happen in an SDLC, whether it's waterfall or agile, you can use this common language and process to drive much more efficient. Um, operational excellence. So a lot of Lean Six Sigma is all focused on, okay, I want to look at a group of processes or a single process through the Mac. I, want, I need to understand what's going on. I need to do analysis. I have to improve it, et cetera. All good stuff. But if you have something like this with all the data and the operational intelligence that I mentioned, now I can look at things from a 30,000 foot view level. Where do I have waste and, inefficiency and, and inefficiencies? Where do I use technology in the wrong way, et cetera, where I can start to make those strategic decisions? Enterprise architecture design. So now I could look at what my business does, which most enterprise architecture teams are defining the future state of IT don't have. And how can I leverage this to um, create a more business aligned IT environment that's agile in the face of change? Risk management. I mentioned banking. Risk, uh, banking is one of the most heavily regulated industries around. Uh, and this is a huge topic. I worked at Citi. Citi um, had a, uh, in 2020, had a, a $400 million consent order. And a consent order is basically the regulators, the Fed and the OCC, saying, your control environment is terrible. You need to fix it ASAP. Fast forward, it came out on July 10th. Uh, another article that said, the, uh, the Fed and the OCC find them $135 million because they had made zero progress on improving the control environment. And that's because they lack business context, which, which is something that process inventory is good at. So I could go through, I'll go through some of these a, a little bit quick. I might be running out of time. Keep me honest, Katie. Yeah. Okay. So strategy to impact, a little bit more detail on this. So. What is the strategy process? Every organization has some level of mission. Um, why does the organization exist? Vision, where are we going? And never quite get there, so you're always kind of updating that vision. And your strategy, how do we get there? And that could be a whole host of things, from new business models to mergers, acquisitions, market expansion, technology rationalizations, et cetera, et cetera. But when you do that strategy process, you're doing a, a SWOT, an internal analysis, which is where are my strengths and weaknesses, and then the external, what is the external goal? What are the, what's the competitive environment, what's the political environment, use the pestle uh, framework, economic, social, et cetera. You're looking at all these things to say, how do I need to change where I'm going with this? But as you get to that strategy, and you take these, uh, doing a merger, let's say, now uh, if, I, if I can understand what the, the changes in the strategy, now I can map that, as I mentioned, to specific processes, now I can get that down to my work effort and down to a single individual what they need to do. So it's full traceability from this high level strategy all the way down to what an individual person does because you have this clarity of what the process environment looks like. Um, the change process, so I mentioned, this single language can be used throughout. So, and, and this is where a lot of things fail in projects where you don't def define your scope right, but if you have a if you have a full inventory of all your processes, and I could say, here these are the processes that need to change, and here's what has to happen. Now I could I could um, I could do my target operating model, which is and drill maps. I could take my current state process inventory, and I could build a future state, and I could start to look at what changes in the people, process, and technology. <coughs> then I could do document my requirements. So I take each individual. Um, process and say, what are my requirements for the future? I could do my design. I, I didn't put a graphic up there, up there for design, but you could do your design. I could do my control, and a lot of a lot of risk management talks about shift left, which means I want to get my risk people in to the process as soon as possible, so that they can look at what you're building, what you're going to deploy the, the into the production environment. Does are you deploying risks that are unacceptable? Now, if you can get that in with the common language, now your risk people and your developers and your project team can, can build the right controls. Um, coding, testing, if you're going to 
create requirements <laughs> of design based on process. You should test your process, and that'll help you create a repeatable bed of uh, processes of testing scripts that you could use for regression testing, even if you're not changing that process in some future state. Um, organizational change management. So if you know your process environment, you know the people that are associated with it. Now I can define my my um, procedures and training and job aids and everything associated with that so I can be very laser focused on who I need to educate and what they're doing in this new process environment. And then finally, you could do, you could manage the, uh, the journey. So if I'm defining my scope by process, I have a, a denominator. Let's say my project has 10 processes. Now I need to, to get 10 processes to requirements and design and testing and et cetera, et cetera. So now I can start reporting and how my project's doing through this business lens. Make sense, any questions? So this is just another view of it. So I just take my process, and I do my requirements, and I do my, my future state, my current state, future state, and my risk and controls, and designs, and test scripts, and et cetera. So it's just reinforcing, I'm using this, this process inventory as my common language to do everything. <coughs> and I align all the stakeholders uh, through this process through this uh, exercise. Um, here's one thing that's, you, you'll probably read a lot of transformations are done through the lens of the customer, which makes sense. It's very, customers now have the power to vote with their feet if they're not getting what they what they expect and deserve. And a lot of organizations are standing up uh, customer experience teams, and they're doing things like creating customer personas, which is really understanding who your customer is from an experience, uh, uh, emotional perspective. So what do they care about? What, what do they want in your, uh, what, are, what are their expectations, et cetera. And then they create customer journeys so they can map out that journey end to end. One thing that this adds is now if I can tie everything together, so who are my customers? What is their experience? What pain points or what, um, what opportunities do I have? And if I can trace that down to what process is at each step, what are the resources of the process models and what are the resources ultimately? Now I can take that high level pain point from a customer and be very specific on what has to change. Even down to like, what is a business rule within an API, within an application? Like what is that problem that, uh, that, that is, is changing? So I think this, this could just, it's all about connecting the dots, uh, ultimately. Um, if you're an architect, this can help in many ways. So from governance. In governance, there's always a, a, uh, a tension between the business and technology. Business is always saying, I just need to get something done. I don't care about your standards, whatever, just get it in, I have deadlines, et cetera. And architecture is like, but I have a design. Like I, I need a certain set of standards. This helps the, the architecture governance teams by understanding, they know the strategy, they know what's gonna happen, they could they could get out ahead of it and, and um, help the business design the right uh, architecture. Uh, intelligent process automation. So there's a lot of a lot of articles and whatnot about uh, automation teams <laughs> automating the wrong thing. But if you could look at the top level and work with your leaders and say, what are the processes that are pains for you? What are, what do you really care about? And then now you could you could automate the right processes. And that's what this looks like. I put a heat map in front of them and say, tell me what's the pain point. Uh, digital twin. I think I have a slide. I'll, I'll talk through that. A little bit later, uh, business-led module architecture. So this is microservices. So what is a microservice? It's a small application that does a very small and finite thing, but you could change that functionality in 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 matter of weeks as opposed to a nine-month typical project. So if you could understand what your processes are, then you could define the bounded context for those those microservices. Um, uh, process IT transparency and I think this is a, a pretty cool thing that I've done with some clients, but if I know my process inventory, so I decompose what the business does at a top level, now I can create something called system interaction diagrams. Because if you go down to a low enough level process, you can't go any further because then now everything's in the bowels of IT. But if you create another diagram, you know that a activity in a process can, hit, can trigger a set of handoffs in the technology environment. Now my swim lanes become systems. And I, I, I attach that event, and that event goes from system one and hands off to system two, hands off to system three, et cetera, et cetera. Now I get a full traceability from what the business does down to um, down to business rules within an application. And if I could build and maintain that, 
now everything's transparent how all that all that works. Uh, application portfolio management, which is really about what are my systems doing relative to what my business needs, and do I have overlap and redundancies and so that I'm optimizing the spend in my IT environment. Um, so it's ultimately it's all about getting to an agile um, agile IT environment that can respond to uh, uh, of, of the changing external world. So digital twin, I'm, I'm pretty excited about this. I think this is this is something that could revolutionize kind of how businesses run over the next you know, five, ten years or whatnot. But a lot of IT, I'm sorry, a lot of AI is peripheral to processes in my view. I could take a draft email and I could put it in ChatGPT, or I could put a contract in there and it could tell me if the terms are favorable to me or not. But what it what it doesn't do right now is it's not educated on what your environment does. Where's the inefficiencies? Where's the uh, ugliness? Where's the dead bodies? If you could take some, and digital twin is a concept that is big in manufacturing, which a digital twin is a virtual replica of your real world environment. So a lot of manufacturers use it because station one does this, and station two does this, and station three does this. So if I create a model of that and I back it with an AI engine, I could take data signals from those different things. And now I could use AI to tell me where am I inefficient? Where do I have pen, uh, issues that may come up? Where do I have uh, defects? You name it from an analytical perspective, AI can now help. But how do you do that in a non, non physically tangible environment, like a bank? I came from banking. Um, the concept of the digital twin still holds true, but the um, but there's no since it's not physically tangible. How do you create that? I think the only way to create it is to create one model of the world, which is creating your process inventory. And then using that and then backing it with all the data in the environment, marry those two together, that becomes your your, um, your single source of operational intelligence or your, your digital twin. If you if you use the process names as your data labels to, to throw out all the sources of your of your uh, your data inputs, now that becomes your digital twin your in your inventory. This was an area that we had talked about in advance and I was really interested in too. Yeah. I was hoping to kind of ask some questions. So immediately I thought of two possible things. I'm hoping maybe you could enlighten us with, with yeah. more, maybe something I think about. But let's say hypothetically there's a bank. Yes. And there's this stuff called regulation yeah. and laws and stuff come out every year because it gives them something to do in DC, I guess. So um, so if you know that something's coming in January or next year digital twin could help you possibly prepare to say where are we risky or, or yes. have issues operationally. Mm -hmm. It doesn't have to be IT related. Yes. Um, but also um, beyond that, maybe you're going to, someone wants to introduce what they perceive as a very small change somewhere. It can have ripple effects and un unintended outcomes that we didn't think of, right? Yes. And sometimes you don't catch those until six months after something's been implemented and then you gotta deal with that technical debt or challenges and no one ever ties it to that project that was already closed. Yeah, that's true. Right? Law of unintended, uh, unintended consequence. But are there like other scenarios where you think a digital twin can really show value? Um, cost optimization. Do I have too many people doing something that really is not value added? Um, do I have customers? Um, do I have issues in my environment that may impact my customer but haven't yet? And maybe I could tackle it before there's actually there's actual impacted or uh, pain experienced by my customers. I put up a bunch there. I said uh, risk management, the regulations, uh, employee experience, you name it. I mean, I, if there's a metric that you use to manage your operating environment, I think digital twin can help you because it's really just. Uh, an automated assistant that helps you crunch through those numbers that could that could team with the, the little teams in the world. And just do some hypothetical what ifs, right? Yeah, exactly. So so in like manufacturing, for instance, right, you use digital twins to actually look at your entire throughput of manufacturing from raw materials all the way through and you look to see where your bottlenecks are. You can look to see, you know, where you actually have surplus and capacity, where you actually uh, and then Ultimately, where you're going to have defects, maybe in a machine, right? So you can use digital twins, I think, in a lot of different areas, a lot of different vertical markets. Here's a this may be a, maybe a dangerous or controversial one, but 
you know CICD, um, so you could you could use automation to do code check in, um, do builds, do tests, and ultimately deploy it to where you're going. I could see a day where you don't even need humans anymore to to, to develop change. So if you could educate the environment on <laughs> where your what your processes are, what the code behind it is, how it connects to everything, you just do a prompt and say. I want to create an application that does this. I want to connect these two things mm -hmm. and do this thing, or whatever. You know, theoretically, a digital twin could just create requirements, do the design, and just humans checking, them, maybe humans checking them along the way. Create the code, deploy it, test it. Like, hey, now it just works. Good. It seems like you know, the cost of developing a digital twin is going to scale with complexity of the business that you do, right? So, and it sounds like it's just it's a simulation of your business, yeah. right? So, um, the, when you do this kind of thing, you know, how do you make kind of trade-off decisions around how deep to go and so forth? Because I can imagine you know, if you really wanted to make this a perfect simulation of your business, it's cost prohibitive, mm -hmm. right? I think first you have to you have to look at what's important to you, so obviously, so you can prioritize. Um, but then I, th I think this is something you just you could build iteratively over time. So first, I want to just get the landscape of what what all the processes are. I want to add the application, so at least I know the impact of the application. Or I want to add, you know, you could add little things at a time and continue to tune your use cases, the analysis that's happening, and what help that you're getting. Absolutely, absolutely do them on an iterative basis. There's um, a lot of the process modeling tools, and, and um, Jason works at, at Software AG uh, can do this. Um, and then there's there's a there's a bunch of other um, uh, platforms that do digital twins as well, where you can take your data and all sorts of things. This sounds really good. Um, but it scales with complexity, and it seems, I mean, how much work is it to go through all of these levels across all of the breadth, all of the depth, and does it does it not lead to analysis paralysis? No, it, it, there's a, that's a great question, actually. Um, I'll tell you, when I was at Citibank, I, I was head of process excellence for the U.S. Retail Bank, which is a very complex business. I mentioned two credit card businesses, mortgage, retail bank. Um, a lot of underlying support teams, risk, fraud, et cetera. Um, I didn't necessarily have a mandate from the top to do this. I just, I got in the job, I was like, well, I'm just gonna start calling the assistants of the heads of the business, and they took my meetings. I'm like, hey, I can do this. Like, sure, go ahead, I will do it. So I had four people that I, I did all of, so I was there for, I did this for about a year, did 75% of, of city bank. And I think I estimated it was about 10,000 processes. I did it with four people. And what makes, this is actually a lot less, just to get the process inventory is a lot less complex than you think. Because there's no religious debates. If, you ever, if you've ever done a capability model, there's religious debates of don't call it this, call it that. You know, it needs to go back forever, back and forth forever. Um, but if I'm asking you what your team does, it's just an interview process. What do you do? I don't, nobody really cares about what language you use, and I want to use your language. So I, I typically do two meetings. I have one meeting with you and I do an interview. What do you do? Shake it out a little bit. I'll go back and I'll pull some metadata that I need and I'll do some alignment and I'll come back to you and say, is this right? And it's a lot more efficient just to get the process inventory than you think. Now the process modeling, that is a, that's a different uh, game, but that I think you prioritize. What do you need specific detailed process models for? And then you go down to that level for whatever you're trying to but if you're aligning it to like your SDLC, you're doing effort anyways. If I get the process names, you might not do the process model. Um, and it's just, it, it'll make things, you'll save more time in that process uh, than, than you think. Go. I just had one more question. I don't, don't know if you're going to cover it or not. Um, and maybe if you are, kind of already answered it. Um, oftentimes the success of a group or an internet group is having the right owner. Yep. The right sponsor. Right. Where have you seen it have the most success? Not where it started and died. Yes. I'm sure that's happened. 
it like work? Have you seen it thrive and do very well organizationally? Like what? Oh, like where in the organization? Where would this live? Is it in risk? Is it in enterprise SDLC? Is it like where does it have to live so it doesn't get killed by other processes? Yes. I've seen I've seen a couple different options um, in the transformation office, which which typically has a has a defined end date, so probably not ideal. But you know, transformations can happen three or four years or five years or whatever. Right? Um, it can happen in technology. I don't. I think it can, it can obviously work, but technologists, tech, CIO organizations tend to be very technology focused. Um, so that could be that could be hindrance because this is a business oriented uh, thing. Risk again is, is more risk oriented, so they may not be open to driving other use cases that are outside of risk. I personally think the the best option is probably going up your COO. Um, so your COO is responsible for managing your operations. And this is a core part of how you do operational excellence. Just a couple more, last topic, and then um, I might be getting the hook. Okay. <laughs> so risk management. So uh, I mentioned Citibank and some of the challenges, but the, the, the core part of why these banks, why, why businesses that have risk as a big agenda item fail is because they lack business context. So if you, if you think about, um, and, and there's a, a GRC platform or, or risk, everyone who does risk management has a risk repository. And that risk repository ultimately has a data model, which is what are my processes? What are the risks on those processes? What are the controls on those risks? And how do I monitor those controls? Most organizations, and I put process inventory as the core of this data model here, but most risk organizations have, have um, use a generic uh, taxonomy, like an EPQC. One taxonomy that covers all the businesses. When I was at City, the problem is your mortgage doesn't look like your retail bank, doesn't look like your credit card. So when people are doing risk assessments at the lower level, they're like, well, this taxonomy doesn't look like what I'm what my business does. So I'm just gonna interpret what this happens here, what that happens there, et cetera. That creates really bad risk data and it creates a lot of confusion in the in the risk operating model, your three lines of defense. So and I'm working with a a number eight bank in in, uh, in the U.S. that's North Carolina based, as you probably guess, but on this on this specific challenge, which is how do you define your specific processes so that your risk assessments and your design your controls are really truly um, uh, fit for what you're trying to accomplish? Um, and more diagrams about you can just take your process name. Now I can look at all my different risk types: so compliance risk, ops risk, uh, regular. Um, Operational resiliency, third-party vendor risk management, financial risks. It's uh, applicable to all. Right. The, the last I'll just close with this. This does this does take an investment. It does take some commitment from leadership. Um, but I think there's going to be cost either way. So if you do not do this, you're going to pay in missed deadlines, missed budget, confusion in your environment, frustration. You name it. If you do do it, I think you could champ you could tackle the transformation challenges and deliver for what your organization needs. So, with that, any other last questions before I get the hook? Sir, what percentage total of all the processes that you analyzed? Um, what percentage of all of those um, are <coughs> right for automation itself? So, like for example, you know, a product owner at a company may, you know, not be able to work on development for their product because they're so busy with billing, contract management, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So, and the ROI itself, you know, the ROI on automation of mundane processes is pretty, is an easy sell from the bottom, right? So, what total percentage of, of all those processes, you know, can be automated and then what kind of ROI are you seeing? Because I'm interested in that for our business because I know RPA and that kind of stuff is, it's a, it's a good question. I don't know that I have, oh, Jason, do you have a perspective? I'll pick on you. Uh, go ahead. <laughs> the, uh, I don't know that I have a, a, a specific percentage to, to give you. Um, I, I think, you know, I think this, I don't know the answer to your question. So I don't, I don't really focus on automation just to be, just to be fully transparent. Um, but I think this will just give you a way to look at everything and say, you know, where, where do your resources live? Where's my bank for the buck? Is it even worth it? And then how does it work and what does it connect to? 
so that when I do my automation, uh, like I can design my program. I think I think one part of automation though is your core level of automation, whatever you're trying to do, either whether by AI or automation, the foundation of what you have around a process um, has to be solid, and you have to know every part of that in order to then create automation around that. Because if you create automation around a crap process, <laughs> it's going to be crap, right? And so. Or if it's clear. <laughs> yes, much much quicker to the crap. Yeah. Thank you for the time today, guys. Yeah.